Good afternoon. I'm Karen. I'm from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we are here this afternoon to discuss a really interesting book. This is The, the Devil You Know. And this is by Dr. Gwen Adsett and Eileen, I'm sorry, Eileen Horn. I'm sorry, Eileen, I messed up. That's right. Um, I think I've read the whole book. I think it's interesting. I think it's surprising. I think it's educational. I think it's thought provoking and even a little bit humorous from time to time. And we feel very fortunate this afternoon that they are going to discuss the book um, and I'm going to leave you on your own and then we'll get to some questions and answers from our audience. So if you gals would like to start, please go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much for inviting us to, to be here this afternoon. It's an enormous pleasure for us to be um, in the poison pen. Um, that's fantastic. And it's um, and I'm very much enjoying having this opportunity to interact with American readers because it was very important to me when I when when I was first thinking about this book, I really wanted to reach out to um, to all audiences, to an, uh, a non-professional audience, but I really wanted to reach out to people all over the all over the world who would be interested in this kind of thing because I know from visiting from visiting in the states I've worked in the states a little bit and I have family there so I know from visiting there that this is an area that people are interested in so when I was to be able to work with an American co-author was very important to me I, I'm your, I'm I'm Gwen's translator really we're two countries <laughs> divided by the same language and although I spent most of my life living in England um, I suppose that my uh, slight American accent and definite American sensibility has been helpful, if only in that I keep asking as we as we went through the process of compiling the book, um, I kept asking Gwen, well, is that like that case, you know, where the shooter did this in Los Angeles or is that like that Supreme Court case? And so we, the book is about an English doctor's work with um, violent offenders who have mental illness, but it's also about the human condition, human nature, and you know, criminal violence and offending around the world. And we also bring in examples of cases in Europe, Australia, et cetera. So um, hopefully it's, it's got a global reach. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think truthfully, I mean, maybe I'm overstepping here, but I really, I think that there are a few human beings who are not interested in what makes people do cruel and evil things. And I think it's been one of the things that I found in my work that you know, people are naturally fascinated and everybody's got a view. Everybody's got a view on what makes people do horrible things. Everybody's got a view about what should happen to such people. And, and I think that it's a privilege therefore to be able to move out of the academic sphere where I'm a bit more familiar and come out to share what I've learned about working with violent offenders with you know, an interested intelligent public who I know are interested in crime and what makes people criminal and what makes people decide to do criminal things. Because I like reading that fiction myself. So yeah. I, before, before, I, before I became a forensic psychiatrist, I was interested in what makes people kill, for example. So, mm -hmm. so I, I really wanted to be able to reach out to this audience, but the wonderful thing about working with Eileen is that, is that she was able to put a dramatic storyteller's voice, mm -hmm. um, create, and, and we together we created a kind of portraits of people. Don't you think, Eileen, or? Yeah, yeah. Or I, think, I think we use a rather um, fancy term like mosaic portraits. So one yeah. of the one of the challenges that you know you had and that we used to talk about just over a cup of tea when you were thinking about writing a book about evil was um, you know the ethical difficulty and the legal difficulty of it because um, unlike Sigmund Freud who could you know change the name of one of his neurotic female patients um, and pretty much just say what happened in the therapy room with a few details changed you you know you absolutely cannot do that. Um, you're working, I mean, everyone needs to protect their patient's privacy, but you absolutely must because that you've got their families to consider the victim and their families. It's, it's really a, a serious um, responsibility to protect them. So um, 
we decided that maybe this, the, the way through that to, to break through that difficulty was to pull together, let's say, 10 stories or 20 stories of female stalkers, as we do mm. in one of the chapters, and make up a name. And actually, I made up the appearance of the people as well. Um, so that because I've never met any of Gwen's patients, there was an ethical wall between her and them. No one will ever be able to pick up this book, read it and go, oh, my God, that's the guy that killed my mother. No, it won't happen because physically and in terms of their accent and their even some of their turn of phrase, um, you know, that's where my kind of creative nonfiction has come in. But they are all utterly clinically accurate, uh, aren't mm -hmm. they? You know, and, and really based totally in Gwen's experience. And and one of the great benefits of having worked as long as I have done is that I can is that we can build up mosaic pictures with tiny fragments mm. from a mm. from across sort of twenty five years of work, um, and and that's helped to build up a picture um, that's clinically accurate but protects everybody's privacy and their sensibilities because it is a privilege to do this work. Um, and it's important not to, you know, you can't exploit that privilege. Um, mm. But the other thing that you've often said, Eileen, sometimes when we've been talking about this is how these chapters are almost like short films. Mm. And I think there is something about, I think, I really hoped, we both hoped, I think that this would, book would be an invitation to people to come mm. and see what I see, come and mm. meet the people that I meet, but come as it were alongside with me and mm. come and see yeah. what I see and so that there's a kind of joint journey we're coming together to look at something and, and get up close and look at something that perhaps people haven't looked at before after the prison door shuts after the judge gives his his or her sentence what happens then and this so the book is a kind of invitation to come and see what happens to mm. who've been convicted of very serious crimes of violence and what therapy is what kind of therapy can be offered to them mm. Actually, you're reminding me of a bookshop event I went to many years ago, many, many years ago in London with the great Italian author Umberto Eco. Uh, wow. And there was this incredibly sycophantic woman interviewing him, very young and obviously starstruck because, you know, he was so eminent and amazing. It wasn't that long after he wrote The Name of the Rose. Um, possibly one of the great classic modern crime novels. Um, and she said, oh, Mr. Echo, oh, you're so brilliant. Uh, what made you decide after all the other things you've written to write a book that is an investigation? And he went, my dear, everything I write is an investigation. Mm -hmm. um, and that just comes to mind as you're talking because um, yeah. really this book is an investigation. You know, we talk about it as a journey into the criminal mind because, you know, publishers like those phrases. But <laughs> the truth is, it's more than that. It's an investigation of evil, of good and evil together, of um, our own states of mind. And perhaps you want to say why why we chose this title. Well, um, 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 I mean, I we we had a we had a lot of difficulty with the title i think it's fair to say because there were all sorts of things that we really didn't want to reference we really didn't want to talk about evil um in the title as it were but one of the things um about the title is that it, it refers to an old irish proverb in fact this idea that it's better to know the devil, the, the devil you know is better than the one that you don't. And that certainly fits really with my work as a therapist, where we think it's probably better to know more about the mm. devils that, that bother us. And that if we really want to understand the roots of violence and criminality, and if we want to do something about them, we better get up close and personal and understand them, really get to know them well. So that idea of the devil you know is that it's this is the best way to try and understand human cruelty by getting up close and looking at it um, including so, our own not just theirs <laughs> but ours yeah and, yeah and it's my you know my original idea i i'd want i'd wanted to write a series of rather prosy essays um about the nature of evil um, um but i don't think anybody would uh, well i was going to say nobody would read this book uh, although i will tell you a funny story um I had I had a proposal out and it was going to be published with a with a small academic publisher, but it went, it got out on Amazon um, that I was going to publish this book. It was going to be called a short book about evil, 
Um, and um, so that was there on Amazon. And, um, and I looked one day to discover that somebody had reviewed this non-existent book called A Short Book About. <laughs> And not only had they reviewed it, but it was a bad review. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I think that really convinced me. If I needed convincing, that my 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 collection of prosy essays was not going to work, and I needed Eileen to help me create a voice that would be able to speak much more clearly and much more uh, openly and warmly. I I think. Um, but I do. I did start, and I do start from the premise that we all have a capacity for evil and cruelty, and it's exploring our own capacities for evil and cruelty that I think are at the heart of our fascination around evil. I mean, I, I maybe I'm again, maybe I'm, I'm over generalizing, but I think that many people are drawn to reading crime fiction because they wonder, they wonder deep down, could I do this? Could I kill my spouse for the life insurance? <laughs> could, I, could I kill this woman because she's inconvenient to me in some way? Could I kill this person because I really hate them? Um, you know, I think, I think, and that, of course, crime fiction, as P.D. James always said, it's always about murder. It's not about armed um, robbery or stalking. It's usually it's about murder. So, so we're really talking about what makes people kill. And, and I, I guess, you know, I've always wondered whether in the right circumstance, in the right place of all those risk factors lined up, maybe I could kill too. You know, I remember wow. early on when I was, you know, busy feeling stupid and like a lay person asking, you kept using this expression, risk factors, and you said, you know, that's my job. I wonder if you could just define um, what forensic psychiatry is um, and forensic oh, yeah. psychotherapy, because you do both, but in England versus America as well, because I really had to have that explained to me. Sure, sure. And, um, and uh, I, yeah, so forensic psychiatry is the psychiatry of looking after the mental health of offenders who've committed violent offenses. But, um, but the slight difference is, is in the States, uh, forensic psychiatrists tend to be psychiatrists who mainly give evidence in court, in, le in, in different kinds of courts. So obviously the criminal courts, but also in family courts and civil courts. And so forensic psychiatrists are, are psychiatrists who give legal testimony. But in the UK, they are also people who take care of people who've committed violent offences when they were mentally ill or become mentally ill while they were serving prison sentences. So in my world, I do go to court. I do give it. I work quite a lot in the family courts because I'm interested in parental mental health and particularly mothers with mental health problems. Um, but um, I also um, I also look after people with mental health problems who've committed violent offences. So there's that kind of dual role about being a forensic psychiatrist. And, and I trained as a therapist because I wanted to really spend time understanding, understanding how people had let themselves do these terrible things. Because if we could understand that, maybe you could help them not do it again in the future. So the risk factors that you mentioned the work of a forensic psychiatrist is always about trying to help people reduce their risk, their future risk. So forensic psychiatrists are people who spend a lot of time thinking about risk factors for violence. Um, and, you know, we, and we developed, well, we, we, in the book, we describe a kind of model for thinking about risk factors about violence, which is actually based on an idea developed by a lovely colleague of mine called Peter Aylward. And he had this idea that we all have this capacity for violence within us, but it's held by a kind of internal psychological lock, which is like a bicycle lock. But that bicycle lock has numbers, risk factors for violence, such that if all those numbers lined up, that lock might open and the violence might come out. So it's a neat kind of metaphor, really. Can you just talk about what those risk factors are? Well, I mean, com common ones. Yeah, well, I think it's I think I, I find it helpful to think about them um, from, as it were, from the common ones to the sort of rarer ones, the more specific. Ones. So there are common ones like being young and male, um, which is not particularly helpful in trying to do risk assessments. But this is the, if you think about it, this is the approach that people do when they quote you for car insurance. What's who, who are the people who are most likely to get in the car accident? Young male. So mm -hmm. and this is the violence. So um, um, I I. I don't want to be wish to be rude to any young males at all. I have two, 
my household and they're not violent in any way, but um, it's undoubtedly the case that being young and being male are, risk, are very basic general risk factors for violence. And then the next couple of risk factors that are, are really to do with people's minds and mental states and they're to do, and they're risk factors about how antisocial you are, how willing you are to break the rules, substance misuse, big, big risk factor because it's a disinhibitor and it makes people do things they wouldn't otherwise do, it stops people thinking. Um, and some kinds of very severe mental illness, very rarely severe mental illness can actually increase your risk of acting violently, particularly if you're paranoid, which if you think about it, it makes sense. If I'm so terrified that I'm, <coughs> I'm going to be attacked by somebody else, I might attack first, that kind of a thing. But mm -hmm. often the last number of them in the lock is something that's very personal to the offender something that really relates to unresolved trauma or unresolved distress, something that has real personal psychological significance for them. Mm -hmm. And that's often the thing that we're looking for or exploring in therapy with offenders. Mm -hmm. I remember you telling me that that is the most fascinating factor. And in, in you talked to me once about a case where a guy said that the thing that triggered him or sent him over the edge, he had a lot of those risk, risk factors. But for him, the final thing that you worked out after a long period of therapy was that the woman he killed smiled at him funny. Yes. <laughs> that phrase just stayed with me, smiled at him funny. I, I've been very careful not to smile at anyone ever since, but you know, it's-, it's Well, and, it, and it, it, yes, I think, but I think what that tells us is that this was someone who was in a, already in quite a disturbed state of mind. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's true that she smiled at him in a funny way, but I'm confident that what he saw, he was seeing her face through a lens, a kind of distorted lens of distress mm -hmm. and fear and cruelty and who knows what else. Um, and something about what he saw made him feel perhaps belittled or frightened or threatened or all of the above, enough perhaps to tilt him over the edge into action. Yeah. And, it, and it is very sadly the case that sometimes it is something that the victim does that is the last risk factor that tips a, a perpetrator of violence into action. I, I hasten, hasten to emphasize that that doesn't mean that the victim is in any way to blame for what happened and mm. not at But we're really talking about, and what I'm trying to sort of tease out here is something about, it's a bit like Jenga. Isn't it? what the last the last block the, to go um and it's just looking at how those things fit to get fit together as risk factors hmm. um Gwen I was talking before the event about uh, how we met um Karen was asking how we met and you know we're old friends we met through Gwen's sister um and actually our initial rapport was because we both love reading crime fiction and so i would send her a book and she would send me a book and we would trade back and forth our favorite authors um and there was some crossover but i guess because i was raised in america um mine was definitely had had a more american flavor and so you introduced me to some work that although i had been educated in england i didn't know um my um odyssey with crime fiction probably started with edgar Allan poe with whom i had a very unhealthy obsession when I was really quite young. Um, and, uh, you know, he's considered, I suppose, the father of, of crime fiction in a way. Um, and, and then kind of went into Raymond Chandler and people like that. And then all the great women uh, crime fiction writers, you know, Sarah Pretzky and Patricia Cornwall and blah, blah, blah. I mean, so many. Uh, Donna Leon is a real favorite of mine because I love Venice. Um, and then, of course, the kind of gritty men. I, I loved James Crumley and James Elroy and those wonderful Elmer Leonard people with that incredible mm -hmm. dialogue, you know, amazing vernacular. Um, but your journey was really quite different. I'm fascinated when you talk about that. A very, a, 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 such, a, such a different one. And they are, it goes back to what you were saying about the two worlds with a common language, because it's amazing mm -hmm. what you can do with the same, the, the same language. Because mm -hmm. I grew up with a very, what you might think, a very traditional sort of British kind of detective story. Um, uh, W.H. Jordan wrote a wonderful short story, a short piece about this called The Guilty Vicarage. Um, and it's really all about the idea about, about violence and disorder in, 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 in sort of places where you don't expect it and how, the, how detective fiction is about bringing order 
back to out of chaos that you know there's a there's a situation where chaos is caused and the detective comes and puts everything back into an ordered cosmos again but it's often set in an english village um or an english or, or indeed in an english and not always in a vicarage but <laughs> the body in the library that kind of thing so i i grew up first reading agatha christie um, perhaps not so many millions of readers around the world and um, I was 10 years old I think when I started reading Agatha Christie and I loved it I, 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 I remember really getting them from the local library and really enjoying reading those but I also I grew up in New Zealand so um, and didn't come to live in England until I was 11 so I was also exposed quite early to the work of Nio Marsh who was also a golden age uh, a writer um, and very successful in her time, maybe not so well known now, but very well known in her native New Zealand. And um, she made me, you know, she made me want to write detective fiction, I remember. Um, I and think then, you did. You did. You told me once that you did write a little detective story when I you were a kid. Story when I was about nine. You know, <laughs> but, but um, and, and the, the plot hinged on, um, on on a high priest being poisoned. I think I must have been, I can't think of where I got these ideas from. Um, I think it must have been some Rudyard Kipling kind of story also, perhaps that my father read me. I mean, I think the other thing is that my father, I was very exposed to detective fiction. My father read me the books that he'd enjoyed as a child. So he read me John Buchan. So mm. Preston John. Um, and The Three Hostages, which is again, which is a great, not exactly a detective story, it's more of a sort of thriller, but The Three Hostages is a great story. Mm. Crying out to be made into a, uh, um, um, crying out to be made into a television uh, series, I think. Um, but uh, so those were read to me as bedtime stories. So um, so I very much enjoyed those. But then when I got older, the, the I guess the crime fiction that I was very influenced by was Ruth Rendell and P.D. James, just because of that kind of clarity of prose. And Ruth Rendell, of course, is famous for writing two separate kinds of mm. detective story. One traditional police procedural with a very, with a, with a very nice, a very nice detective, a very plausible kind of detective. And her character work is brilliant. Um, mm. of his family life and he's not he doesn't have problems he doesn't you know he's not an alcoholic he's not got demons he's just he wants to do a good job and he can't understand why it's hard and then uh, and then her psychological thrillers mainly about people who she conceives of as being psychopathic and they are very they are also very interesting um, although less obviously detectively um, but but I think P.D. James is my favorite because her prose is just astounding Mm. And she has such a clinical eye almost for cruelty. You know, she's dispassionate. She has, she, she, I think, is modeling that kind of stance that you and I have tried to write about in the book that we call radical empathy, mm. where you get up close to the cruelty, you get up close to what you think of as evil, but you because you're interested and you, you're curious, but you also keep a very respectful distance from it. Um, mm. You know, you're showing the interest, you're interested in the human face of this cruelty, but you're also keeping a distance and you're taking a kind of perspective on it so that the, the outcome, the consequences of this cruelty don't get forgotten or lost. You don't get seduced by um by the person that you're that you're looking at and i think pd james is brilliant at doing that absolutely brilliant do you think that your interest in all this crime fiction sort of uh influenced you nudged you into this career because i know you qualified as as a regular as a doctor first um of course and like all psychiatrists but then you had to choose a specialism um like why this yeah well i i think i think it must have done at some level because um, I was always quite interested in the law. I was always interested in moral decision making. And in a way, crime novels are nothing if they're not morality tales. Mm. I mean, just as the as ancient Greek drama is a morality tale, these, you know, these narratives are our first stories about people killing and why people kill and how they feel at the time and how they feel afterwards and what it does to everybody around them. Those ancient Greek tragedies are our very first crime crime fiction, if you like, mm -hmm. really. And um, and I guess I was always interested in what makes people do bad things. Um, 
And um, I don't know if that makes me a peculiar child or an ordinary child. I think probably just a fairly ordinary child, really. But but I was lucky, I think, in my working life to be interested. I, I was able to, to have a chance to study law and, and ethics in medicine. And I did quite a lot of deep study about a moral reasoning and ethical dilemmas in medicine and then how the law approaches that. So then I got interested in the law and how and legal judgments, analyzing legal judgments, understanding a bit more about how lawyers think about how, particularly in the context of criminal responsibility. Um, and I did a, my dissertation on criminal responsibility and how you decide, how, you, how do you decide whether someone's criminally responsible or not and where does mental illness fit into that? So, um, so after that, really, there was only one place to go and that was forensic psychiatry. And it was wonderful because there I found lots of like-minded um, colleagues uh, and in fact many of my colleagues were also interested in crime fiction in my and so in my first my senior training we had a big library of crime fiction um, that we used to I love that I love that I remember you telling me also that sometimes your your patients like reading crime fiction and I was a bit taken aback um, and in fact that in you we describe in the book how you um, were one of the people who set up a homicide group, as you call it, a group therapy for people who've killed members of their family, which strikes me as uh, fascinating. Um, and you'd sit in a room with four or five men at Broadmoor who'd all done something to one of their relatives. And and in group therapy, as you talk about it, it's like jazz, you know, and, and just see what comes up and how the conversation evolves. And, and when I was trying to put that into a story I said well how does it begin and you said oh very often they're just talking about what they saw on tv last night you know prisons and hospitals have tvs and and they love Dexter and I was going what do you mean they love Dexter you know this show about um a forensic professional who's also a serial killer well why not and and they would criticize Dexter and criticize the script sometimes <laughs> I think that's fascinating well, you know, I, I absolutely because you know these are just you know the, the people who come. I mean, it is one of the it is one of the great myths, I think, and a very understandable myth, perhaps, that people who've done really extraordinary things must be very extraordinary, must be completely different from. You no, know, they're not like us in any way, and I think what I was very struck by was that when I you know, when I actually got to work with people who killed, I discovered that that they, you know, they were, you know, they of course they were not so different. That they, you know, they got up and they read the newspaper and they made coffee and they 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 liked pancakes or they didn't like pancakes and sometimes they had a job to go to something they didn't have a job to go to. and you know they like football they like watching they like watching television you know and they they quite like crime fiction as well and they. And they didn't, and I think it was interesting that when they were watching Dexter, because I think they were very interested in this idea of two different identities, mm. because a lot of them felt that they also had two different identities, that they had the kind of regular guy identity that they still felt was them, as it were, before the homicide. And then there was the post-homicide identity of being a convicted uh, murderer, of being someone who'd killed and and the, the of the many sad things about a murder is that it's it's irrevocability the fact that you can never wind back time to go back to where you were you can never go back to how it was um mm. and um so they're really they are sort of tragic stories but i i a lot of i mean many of these you know many of these men would talk about what they enjoyed watching on television and did what they've been listening to on the radio. I, I must have told you this, Eileen, but one of the most moving sessions in the homicide group that I think I've ever been in was uh, where one of the guys said to me um, um, that he'd been reading Viktor Frankl. Yes. Um, <laughs> And um, and he'd been, you know, Viktor Frankl, yeah, and the other sort of guys saying, well, what's Viktor who's back there? And said, oh, well, it's about surviving life in, in, in prison. You know, of course, Viktor Frankl was talking about being in Auschwitz and about how you survive by making, holding on to the capacity to make choices. And, um, and i never forget, he said to me, you know, Dr. Gwen, I think this would be right up your street. And I remember thinking, it is right up my street. <laughs> Wherever my street is, this book is up my street. And, and to have that kind of connection with somebody 
um, is really important. And that, and I really want, I do want to say, I want to pay testimony to my American colleagues in Connecticut, because I would never have started that group if I hadn't listened to the work of uh, two wonderful colleagues called, um, uh, uh, I've gone completely blank on one of their names, but um, they're, they're consult consultant psychiatrists in a, in a hospital in Connecticut and um, John Young and Mark Hilbrand. And they developed a group for people who killed a parent when mentally ill. Um, and I was so impressed at the work that they were doing. And they spoke of it with such hope and such humanity that that's what really inspired me to go back and start our own group. And I was very lucky. I had lots of support from my psychology, psychotherapy colleagues, and we got one going and it's still going now, um, uh, which is great. So, um, so when, I really, Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I really, I, I feel a great sense of gratitude to my American colleagues in Connecticut for helping me with that. You're always so generous to Americans, Gwen. <laughs> um, listen, I, I, I just want to pick up on something there. Um, I've heard you talk about, uh, you know, how, how ho hopeful and wonderful it is to do these therapy groups. And you also worked extensively with groups of uh, child sex offenders, giving them group therapy. And I know, I have to be really honest, my first reaction when you talked to me about this was, why? I mean, those people can't change. And I mean, what good does it do? Uh, and I've actually, of course, because I'm a, a, an obsessive writer, um, I read the quotes on Amazon and, and in the newspaper when there's an interview with either of us, you know, people write in the quote in the notes section below. And a number of angry people have written, you know, why do you bother to sit with these people and give them therapy? They can't change. And, you know, uh, there's plenty of other people that are badly in need of mental health care. And I'm interested in how you deal with that if you come across that in person. Well, um, I, I do come, I come across that in person. And I guess, you know, that I, um, I approach it in, in a number of different ways. Um, I think the first, the first thing I always say is that um, it's enlightened self-interest should make us interested in offering therapy to these people. And I'm, they're largely men. There are some women as well, but they're, I, I'm, I, I, they're, they're largely men. So, but it's, it's, it's in all our interests that we help these men become less risky to other people. And the only way we're going to do that is by getting up close to the violence and the cruelty they committed and understanding it. Only by understanding it will we be able to help them stop it in the future and also make a plan for preventing other men to becoming getting into that state of mind. So enlightened self-interest, if nothing else, should make us interested um, in offering uh, therapy. But I would question the assertion that people don't change. I think um, I, I think that many people can and do change. I think that I think it's a truism that we all change across time. It's it's actually impossible for people just to stay exactly as they were. I don't know how many of you have been to an old sort of um, a, you know high school or university reunion recently, but you go mm. back, you see your friends from there, and you say to yourself, they're just the same. And then you talk to them for a while and you realize, no, they're not, actually. There's important things about them that have changed. Some things are the same. There's some things that seem to be very familiar, but there are other things that are very different. Their life stories, their life events have changed them. You know, the people who were so gung-ho when they were 16 are perhaps a bit quieter now. Not going to, perhaps a bit less sort of keen to rush off and do things, a bit more thoughtful than they used to be. So the idea that people don't change is just, it's just not true. I mean, it's just mm. not true. Now, mm. I wouldn't claim that every single person can and can always be helped with therapy. I, I have, and it's one of the bit the abiding professional dilemmas of my life. I think together with, and I, I don't have to make this decision by myself, thankfully, but. One of the biggest decisions that we make in the world that I work in is, is this a guy who, for whom we can do nothing? Mm. That is, and that is one of the most, and just like any other doctor, it's a huge thing to decide that there's nothing you can do. Mm. And of course, we've seen this with COVID. We see this in oncology services. You know, the day you just, the day, the time, the moment you realize that you really can't do anything for this person, 
that is a big thing for any doctor to come, any doctor or medical team to come to terms with. Um, and I'm, you know, it doesn't happen all that often, but we usually think we can have something we can do to try and help this person become a bit less risky. But sometimes we, 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 you know, and, and the hospital I work in specializes in very, very complex, difficult cases. So of course we have more of these more difficult guys there. So we see a few more of those, but, but the idea that people, just to reiterate, the idea that people can't change is, is, I think it's just not, I think it's just not true. And then my final argument is we have plenty of resources to go around if we choose to. There's nothing about offering therapy for offenders that stops victims of violence getting therapy. In fact, you know, that because it's not a closed pot, we could offer as much therapy as we want to. It's only a, it's a question of how we choose to allocate our resources. And there's plenty to go around. Um, but we just have to do it sensibly. You have to think, I have to think about it. And, at, you know, I, I think at present, you know, the worry I have is we just, we don't do enough rehabilitation. Um, British, I think the British system is a bit more, a bit more supportive of rehabilitation than some states in America, but there are plenty of pockets of good practice um, in, the state, in, in the United States as well. But, you know, rehabilitation of prisoners is in all our interests, all our interests. Gwen, I want to go back to something you were saying about the fact that every, almost everyone you're treating is male. Um, in the book, we made a decision that although a small proportion of women are ever uh, criminally violent, um, <clears throat> you'd worked with so many women in female prisons and in the hospital um, that you wanted to talk about it. And actually, female violence is something that often society doesn't want to look at. It doesn't conform to our ideas of what is female, um, which should be more fluid now than they once were, but still seem to get stuck on that idea that the Y chromosome, you know, makes you violent. Um, and I just wonder, it, it, so we ended up including half women and half men virtually, I think in, in the 11 yeah. stories that we tell here, and I'm really happy that we did that. But I just wonder if you could talk about, you know, this idea that I certainly had when we started work, although you changed my mind, um, that men are more violent than women. Yeah, this is a really complicated area um, because there is there is no country or culture in the world, as far as we know from the available data, there is no country or culture in the world where men don't account for at least 80% of violence perpetrators. So women violence perpetrators are always a tiny minority of violence perpetrators. Um, but that still doesn't mean um, that most men are violent, that even those male violence perpetrators are a very small fraction of all the men there are. So mm. there's nothing about the Y chromosome that makes you violent, but it could seem that way if you just look at the way that violence is presented in, in, in the media. Um, and and you know, we, we rightly get worried about violence, you know, and, and, and the, the way that violence is talked about is, is often presented in a very worrying and disturbing way. But, um, but it is, violence, is, is for, violence rates have been falling for 25 years. And, um, and we don't really know why that is. There are lots of potential reasons it's because violence is complicated. But I think that there's something that I strongly suspect that there's something about masculinity and gender roles that's, that's responsible for the high levels of violence perpetrated by men. But when women are violent, I think their violence is very similar. It's just that the absolute numbers are far fewer. Um, mm. And um, and that is interesting. And some people have argued that maybe it just takes more to get a woman over the threshold where she'd be violent. Um, maybe maybe women need to have more than need six or seven risk factors to be present um, before they become violent. But when they are violent, I think it's not different from male violence. I think the states, the cruel states of mind. The, the lack of empathy, the rage, the cruelty, the anger, I think that's all there in women exactly the same way. I don't think it's different for women. It's just that the numbers are fewer. And I think, so, and it was very, we did talk about it long and hard because I didn't want to misrepresent women's violence. 
Um, but on the other hand, the trouble is because males dominate in violence studies, women's violence can get sidelined and, and get out of sight. And I had met so many violent women who I thought really their stories needed to be told. Um, and that because of the difficulties that they face in their rehabilitation, because there's not a lot of rehab set up for violent women because there's so few of them. People mm. don't know what to do with them. Mm. So, so if you're a woman who's killed or if you're a woman, you know, who's, you know, who's very badly, you know, beaten up her child, say, mm. um, you know, it's, it becomes very difficult to get help for yourself, you know, mm. to try get rehabilitated because there just aren't the programs around as we um, describe in the book quite a bit you know just frustratingly over and over again these women are trying to get help and cannot yes and i, I and i think that I, I i really wanted to try and get across to people that we you know that there are women out there um who do violent things and they need help um because just in the same ways that the men need help. And the thing is that if you're a male offender and you get sent to prison, you're expected to do work on your offense. But when women get sent to prison, often they, they don't seem to be offered the same kinds of violence reduction programs as the men are. Hmm. Um, and it's just not, and, and, and their violence and their cruelty, maybe because it's very shameful, um, just doesn't get talked about, I think, in quite the same way. Hmm. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, it's a huge area, as you always say, it is. Nobel Prize winning question, <laughs> this whole question of gender and violence. Um, yeah. you, uh, I'm thinking that we're sitting here in, in the poisoned pen virtually, um, which is, you know, a, a specialist in, in crime fiction. And I know that we've talked about how much we love it. Um, but of course, a lot of crime fiction is transferred onto the big and small screen um, where I get the sense you, you love it less, um, <laughs> maybe. And um, I just wonder what makes you throw something at the screen? What are the myths that are being perpetrated either in crime drama, detective fiction, um, or you know the very related genre of true crime, which has become hugely popular? What about that, given all of your experience and your day job, um, makes you furious? The myths out there that seem to be per perpetrated over and over again. When do you throw your slipper at the screen? <laughs> <clears throat> well, um... Of course, I'm not as like any good psychiatrist. I get maddened by silly depictions of mental illness um, or the suggestion that mental illness makes people violent. Um, that doesn't uh, that sits very uneasily with me because that's a very old myth, um, and um, and I think is is just so misleading and so stigmatizing. Um, but the other thing I think that really does make me want to throw things is um, is really discussions of psychopathy, mm -hmm. because because psychopathy is a is a it, it is an interesting topic. It is an interesting concept. Uh, it's been around you know for at least a hundred years. But again, a concept that was beautifully developed in the nineteen forties by an American psychoanalyst called Hervey Cleckley. Um, who uh, wrote um, a wonderful book called The Mask of Sanity, which um, is worth getting hold of. In fact, the Cleckley family, in, in, in the spirit of pure generosity, have actually put it out online so you can find a PDF on it easily online and download it onto your Kindle. Um, but, um, and he wrote first about, he, for, in a way, is one of the fathers of psychopathy. And um, along with uh, Professor Robert Hare in Canada, who then applied those ideas to, prison, uh, to prisoners um, in federal prisons who committed very violent offences. But from that work has mushroomed, <laughs> spawned some mad, mad ideas about psychopathy and how psychopathy is very common and psychopaths are very intelligent. I mean, you know, there's so much... There's so much out there about psychopathy, which is really largely generated by films and drama. And I get very fed up with um, drama stories that really start with creating a picture of a person. And you can see, oh, yeah, they're going to turn out to be a psychopath. And uh, and they're always the same. They're very charming. You know, they're very intelligent. They're just I don't know. And, and it's just I just don't. And they always have bad haircuts. 
I don't know whether anybody else has noticed this, but if you want to <laughs> spot, spot the psychopath in the movie, Paul Javier Bardem in yeah. No Country for Old Men, there is a fantastic actor and a beautiful man with the most appalling haircut, solely in order to convince us that he's a psychopath. Um, <laughs> as if murdering in cold blood was not bad enough, he has a terrible haircut. I mean, there's just something really mm. odd about it. Yeah, could I could I interrupt you here for a Please. minute? I think it's time for your questions. <laughs> Over to you. I think we have some questions for the oh, audience. Terrific. Yeah. Yeah, do you, do you want to sit here? Sure. Hey, y'all. I thought it would be easier if I just stepped up here to ask you some of these questions. Hi. Um, yeah. But. Uh, you know, before before I do, I mean, it's so fascinating what you were talking about at the beginning of the program about um, kind of the shadow, the shadow self. Uh, Robert Bly has that wonderful little book. Mm. It's a little book. What is it? The little book on the human shadow or something like that. Mm. And of course, you know, in literature, that whole theme is developed all over the place, you know. Very famously in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, of course. The, uh, exactly. I was just thinking about that. Shadow side and, and the capacity that, that we all have for that, you know, if, you know, if under the right amount of stress, you know, what are we all capable of? I mean, it's fascinating. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Notion. yeah. Um, let's see here. And I was, I was going to ask you also, um, is there, uh, with all these risk factors, is there an more of an interdisciplinary kind of approach to 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 therapy for violent offenders and you know treating the physical side as well as the mental side and um looking at all different things that yeah but, say. yeah i think so. yes no i i think so i think the very best rehabilitation programs do very much include attention uh to physical well-being as well and you probably know that you know all prisons you know have you know have gyms and um, and encourage people to exercise. And a lot of prisons have been developing mindfulness programs. Um, there've been mindfulness programs in, in in prisons, particularly in the states. Again, not some perhaps less in the UK, but in the in many prisons in the states have mindfulness programs to try and help uh, prisoners develop more a uh, sort of kind of more attention to their own minds, just becoming aware of thinking more so um so i think that i i'm i have no doubt that that kind of integrated approach is really important it's just about making it possible i guess hmm. i suppose that would be a risk factor too you know as a you know a history of horrible you know eating or nutrition diet all these things play their role don't they of course well, well, unfortunately, uh, we know that um, adverse childhood experiences are a very potent risk factor for for human violence. And a lot of that is to do with socioeconomic deprivation right. uh, and growing up. If you are unfortunate enough to grow up with a, a mum and dad who are both heavy drinkers, heavy substance misusers, who occasionally go off to prison doing time for this and that, then you're growing up in a household where, you know, there's not going to be much you know, food around and what food there is is probably not going to be very good quality. And who's looking out for you to encourage you to look after yourself, to see you as a person of worth and worthy of attention. So uh, so I think we shouldn't be surprised that um, that early childhood diversity has a big impact, of course, on physical and mental health later. As the approach in, in the UK as you're starting to see here in the US of, you know, prisons, um, what am I trying to say? At some point, I think it was in the, maybe the mid seventies, late seventies, the whole notion of rehabilitation was kind of, and I, mm. forgive me if I'm speaking out of turn, but was abandoned in terms of punitive, strictly punitive approach. Yes. Um, I th and that that's slowly starting to turn around, yeah? I really hope so, Patrick. I, 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 there are, I think there have always been pockets of resistance, if you see what I mean. Yeah. But it's, but I, I think it is very striking this this punitive turn in the 1970s. Uh, um, Eileen and I were privileged to hear Brian Stevenson talk about this um, a, a couple of months ago, and um, this idea of developing, you know, lengthy, lengthy incarceration to no great purpose, um, mm -hmm. which 
very expensive, quite apart from anything else. It's a very expensive way um, to deal with human beings. But um, and I think this this kind of punitive turn is such a mistake because it doesn't work. I mean, punishing people, you know, just doesn't doesn't work. It doesn't make them behave better. Um, so um, I think we we're we're a kind of resistance movement. I think we're doing a tag team here. Yeah. <laughs> Good. One of the things that has struck me in society as a whole is we tend to treat the symptoms, not the problem. And yet, I, from the things that I've read in your book, it shows me or it tells me that you do try to get to the problem rather than just treat the symptom. Is that fair? Well, I, I, I think, it, as you say, it makes perfect sense. I mean, there's so many domains in human life where you know, you don't, you know, where you've got a problem, you need to, if you want to fix the problem, you need to know what the roots of it are. Yes. And another reason why we thought about our kind of trying to develop a kind of radical empathy for people who committed acts of violence means going, using the word radix or root to go down to the root of what made these things happen. Because if we can get to the root of them, maybe we could stop them happening in the future. So we were just talking about childhood adversity. And, um, and you know, we know that given that what we know about childhood adversity um, and, it's, and the risks of the late, the potential for later impact on physical and mental health, then actually preventing childhood adversity and particularly preventing physical abuse of children is really an important, is so important if we want to do something about later violence. Yeah. And if, you know, so, you know, it, again, it's something about if we, unless we get to the roots of these things, we won't be able to make sensible plans for the future. Yeah, and I just, I wanted one other comment that doesn't really go with that at all. Um, when my grandson was in seventh grade, they were required to read Night by L.A. Wiesel. Oh, yes. oh, were they? Interesting. And he said to me, Grandma, I don't know how people can do that to each other. Yes. And I, you know, I, I thought of that for a long time, but we didn't, he really couldn't express, you know, what he thought, but to bring that kind of violence to a child that I thought was so young, it gave him a taste of what you know part of life was like yeah yeah well and it's really interesting you say that because actually i actually think that i was probably about that age when i first heard about the holocaust mm -hmm. and i was fascinated by the holocaust and um and just that very question how could human beings do that to each other how how could they do that and how could people survive that was the other thing that i was interested in how on earth did people survive so i and and as you as i'm sure you know one of the reasons that we we say we want people to read this literature even if it is disturbing is is so that we prepare ourselves for mm -hmm. the fact that we have we all of us have that capacity and 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 perhaps only constant vigilance and constant reflection is going to these are going to, maybe these will be the things that will help protect us so that we don't ever have anything like that ever again forgive me if i keep jumping around here because another thing that struck me in your in your book was and i'll use the word listening um i, I can't remember which patient it was but there was a man who said something and you knew there was something important about a word he said you didn't know what it was, but you noted it because you thought sometime it, you could get back to that. And it was not just listening to the patient, it was listening to yourself. Because, let me see, I think I wrote something down. Um, when some feeling was coming up in you, yes. when you were dealing with patient, you had to be very vigilant about, you know, I'm feeling something. Yeah. You may not know what it is, but yeah. so the, the listing went on both sides, your yeah. patient and, and yourself. Yeah, no, I think that's a, I think that's a really nice. Um, I'm really glad you picked up on that observation, Karen. That's really important because um, it, it is it is an important part of the training of a of 
well, it should be for all psychiatrists, but certainly for all psychotherapists, is, is it, I mean, but human beings are, are social animals and we have some degree of emotional porosity, if you like. Mm. There's a kind of osmosis that, I mean, and this is, of course, is what makes books work because, you know, somebody writes stuff on a page and you have an emotion in response. And how much more is that the case when somebody is speaking to you? And we've all had the experience of being in a, being in a room and somebody comes in and starts talking and they're very cheerful and and before you know it you're having you're, you're beginning to feel a bit cheerful too so that kind of emotional contagion is there in human beings especially when they're when they're working quite closely together and so it's it's therefore incumbent on therapists to pay close attention to how they're feeling in the moment um, with the patient as well as to what the patient is saying and the content of what they're saying uh, because sometimes that kind of emotional response to a patient may tell you something very important. Yeah. Well, there's the extraordinary story in the book, which, you know, had to go in as soon as Gwen told me about it, where she kept falling asleep in the presence yeah. of a patient. <laughs> fall, literally falling asleep. Can you imagine being in therapy and your, your nice therapist falls asleep with a woman who had violently murdered somebody and who was, you know, seeming to have made a great improvement over many years in prison and and was in fact going to be moved to a less secure setting. Um, and Gwen was assessing her and, and she kept falling asleep. And it was because the woman was denying her suicidality that she still felt terrible about what she'd done and wanted to kill herself, but she wasn't articulating that. And Gwen had got so close to her that almost by osmosis, she was feeling, if I've got this right, Gwen, you were feeling her big sleep, her, her feeling of wanting to check out. Um, yeah. I, I've never heard of anything like that in therapy. It was absolutely fascinating. We had to put that in. Yeah. 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 You know, I noticed another thing throughout the book, you would quote, um, other academicians or, um, I'm sorry, academics or um, a, a literature, you had Shakespeare in there. One of that struck me if I could quote, this was from Anne Sexton, a poet. Ah, oh, yes. Doctors are only human trying to find it, uh, fix a human being. Mm -hmm. I thought that was kind of true. It was always also humorous. And I think there's a lot more to it, even though that may be a nice amusing summary yeah yeah well um and and, and and i mean i i i firmly believe that our our poets our playwrights our novelists these were our first psychological therapists these were the first people to to put human emotional complexity into words and to puzzle away at why people do what they do and I think so. I think it behoves us sometimes to to see if any of these masters have something that could perhaps really express something beautifully. And 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 Shakespeare for me has always been a really important instructor because mm. there is so much in his plays which really go to the question of psychological complexity. I was just quoting this morning um, where Shakespeare writes about a suicidal young woman. She spoke as one incapable of her own distress. Mm. And in that moment, he's telling us, he invites us to think, what does it mean to be capable of your own distress? And what would it mean to, if you were not capable, would you then be overwhelmed and unable to, to live? And, 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 and that's those kind of psychological insights. I think, you know, I think they're really worth looking out for in, in any kind of literature you read. Mm. Um, and, um, and I think the best literature does make you think about people's minds, including your own. Mm. And I have one last comment question. Um, and I think you mentioned this, uh, the, uh, the public demands punishment of the criminal, whereas you're introducing compassion. And, and it reminded me on a news show, there was a pastor down in Texas near the border and while he agreed with all the restrictions on the border, he also had the compassion for the people that were trying to get away. So he acted on his compassion by supplying water and food, but he still stuck with his belief system. And um, I don't know, does that, does that fit your, your ideas? Well, I, 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 do, I do believe that judgment is important. I think that we as a society and a community are entitled 
to be angry and lament and be distressed when one of our number has caused harm to another member of the community. I think that's only right and proper. And I completely understand feelings of hurt and vengefulness. You know, I completely understand them. And, you know, and I felt them myself at times. But I think that we have to learn to manage those feelings and not let them be determinant of how we manage offenders. Because ultimately, I think it's too costly, morally, psychologically, philosophically, even just in terms of money. <laughs> it's too I'm not sure we can afford vengefulness. I'm just not sure we can afford it. And, and at some point, I think we have to, to let go and, and move on. Um, easy for me to say, I know, but um, yeah. I, I do passionately believe that. Okay. Did you have any uh, other audience questions? I do. Okay, Patrick's going to... Can take... we just like, kind of hang out up there? Yeah, why don't you do that? That's All easy right. for that. Sorry, this is so fascinating. I hope you don't mind if we run a little bit over time. I think the audience is really enjoying it too. Um, yeah, there's an author who has a comment, Karen, uh, Karen, who says, uh, I can see how it would be painful to come to the conclusion that you can't help or rehabilitate someone. Uh, there's no cl closure. Uh, what is often satisfying about a detective novel is we come to understand the villain, to understand his or her context, his past, backstory. So we gain a sense that we've excavated or discovered the quote answer, a mm -hmm. coherent psychology, a logic that connects feelings and actions. This is a great question. Um, that serves as the reader's closure. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing I'm all I always remember as I'm writing my villains is a villain is not a villain in his own head. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. His motives and actions feel legit to him. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, that's absolutely right. And, and we, were, we were having a very similar conversation about this with another crime writer, uh, the wonderful Val McDermott. Oh, who's yeah. A, yeah. Yeah. We know um, her. Yep. You know her, Val, is a wonderful person. And, um, and she and I have met in several different settings. And, uh, and I love her work. And she was saying exactly the same thing as you have to, you have, you, you have to write from the motives, developing, understanding the motives of the person, but also understanding how they make it all right for themselves. And I must say that that was a breakthrough for me as a therapist when I realized that, that, um, that all our guys have a kind of neutralizing discourse is what they call it in the literature, that there's a kind of, um, you make it okay for yourself. You tell you, you create a cover story in which you make it okay for yourself to do this terrible thing. And often in times in therapy, what we're doing is we're dismantling the cover story and helping people build up a newer, richer, thicker, more authentic kind of story about what actually happened and why it was terrible. I would bring that back to every man, you know, um, just as you said that, Gwen, I thought, but we all have neutralizing discourses that we do all of the time. I, I sort of flashed on an actress telling me once when we were filming on location, she, I was a bit taken aback that she seemed to be having an affair and I actually knew her husband back in London and she went, oh, Eileen, darling, doesn't matter doesn't count on location, DCOL. Um, <laughs> I was really shocked. But you know, the truth is that was her narrative. She had, she had worked out just like I always say, there's no calories when you're in an airplane, you know, another neutralizing narrative. A little yeah. compart compartmentalization there. Yeah. What happens, yeah. What happens in Vegas kind of a thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, and also I think detachment, you know, there's a kind of detachment that people can do um, and this, of course, was described by, um, in my many of the Nazi doctors, yeah. uh, that a kind of process of detaching themselves as well as a neutralizing discourse. So I think that's I think that's absolutely right. And um, and I think in a way what what forensic psychotherapists and crime fiction writers have in common is that we're interested in why done it. <laughs> We are indeed, I think, interested in trying to get to the roots of why this happened. And just but the crime writer starts with that to mm. make to make the story, whereas we we we're fine. We, we've got the guy and we've got the crime and now we want to find out why. Mm. Well, there's there's sort of a fairly recent trend in crime fiction that is, I think, really good, which is uh, kind of looking at the ripple effects of crime not just you know yes. 
Yes. You know, how it affects the whole family, how it affects generations. Yeah. Uh, you see that a lot in, in really yeah. good crime fiction. Yes, um, I, I, yeah, there are a couple more questions. Uh, Pat asks, what do you think about the term toxic masculinity? <laughs> it's in the book. It's in the book. <laughs> well, I have to say, I have to say I like it. And, and the reason I like it is because I, I because I want to stand up for healthy, creative, loving masculinity in a way that it, it's it's only by acknowledging that there, there are really good masculinities out there um, that we can understand the kind of toxic masculinity that is offered to some young boys as being the only way of being male. There was a wonderful book published many years ago by a man called John Stoltenberg called On Refusing to Be a Man. And, and, and it was really about what choices young men have. They, it's as if they come up to their masculinity. There are a num What choices do they have? It's like, you know, there's this, there's this, there's this. What kind of man do I want to be? And um, and toxic masculinity seems I think it has to stay there as a as a category because it's clearly a route that some men feel they feel drawn to feel pushed into feel they have to go down feel it's the only way that they feel safe. Maybe it makes them feel bold. I'm not sure. There's lots. Mu there's much more to say about this. But but I think toxic masculinity is real. Um, and I, and I, but I also think it doesn't. It, it only mercifully affects a few, a few men. Not, not all men by any means. Well, but you also told me you think there's such a thing, and we ought to ha enter into the the popular discourse with toxic femininity as well. I do, I do, I do think, I do, I do think, I do think that, um, and that's a, and that's a topic for another day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, have you ever run across someone who scared you, uh, someone without empathy? That's a question. Yeah, yes, I have. Not very, not very often, but once or twice. Yeah, once or twice, um, I've met some someone who scared me. Um, but it, I suppose what's interesting is it's how unusual it's been, really. Um, I mean, I, I always I always take you know precautions. I think you know the sensible the sensible forensic worker is always thoughtful about risk, and it would be very foolish not to be thoughtful about risk. But generally speaking, you know that it's one working in a maximum security prison or a maximum security psychiatric hospital is one of the safest places to work because um, you know where the risk is. But I have I have no I've met people who frighten me. And now I think about it, not all of them were in the psychiatric hospital or in the prison, but still. Mm. Ah, yeah. Some of them were in, well, I shouldn't say in office, right? Um, mm. You know, there are so many examples in, uh, in uh, literature and in film, um, you know, but you think of someone like Hannibal Lecter. We all think of how, how uh, you know, how uh, terrifying he was. And there's so many elements that go into that, you know, his brilliance. Uh, yeah. his intellect uh, yes. and things like that. Uh, and that's become, uh, Silence of the Lambs has become sort of a template for a, a certain kind of thriller. Uh, does that sort of uh, character exist in your experience? Uh, um, in my, uh, I have not met um, such a man. Um, I don't, at least I don't think so. Because in my experience, if they're very violent, they're often not that intelligent. And if they're very intelligent, they're probably not that violent. Because if you're really smart, you wouldn't be carrying out any violence yourself. Because that's dumb. Because violence is a high risk strategy. It's, it's, uh, it has consequences. Um, so you have, have people to do that. <laughs> you might have people to do that for yeah, you. Right. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily do that. I mean, Tony Soprano, if we're, tra if we're trading dramatic representations, you see, I think Tony Soprano is more believable. I think I've met more Tony Sopranos than I've met Hannibal Lecter's. Interesting. Um, yeah. You know, because I think, um, and of course we don't, and we don't see them very much in the hospital because then of course they're not mentally unwell. Um, um, but I uh, meet them more in prison, um, I think. Um, and some women like that, some female Tony Sopranos. Um, 
But I think, um, but the Hannibal Lecters, I, I think are a kind of bogeyman image. Um, and they they make a great story. And I have to say, I think Thomas Harris is a, you know, is a, is a, has an ability to write in a terrifying way. You know, I had to, um, I read Red Dragon and I had to sleep with the light on for a couple of nights, you know. <laughs> but, so, you know, you know, so, you know what, what uh, I think one of the scariest scenes, at least for me in that movie is, um, it, the, the movie part is, is when, they're, when they're transporting Hannibal Lecter mm. and they have, they have him on a dolly and they're mm. wheeling him. And, and the, the thing is, he's so dangerous, we can't even let him walk. We yes. got to strap him in and roll him from place to place. And that's just like terrifying. Yes. Um, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is terrifying. And I mean, I, um, I mean, I have, you know, we, I have met men who are very, who are very violent and disturbed, but they're not, but they're not controlled. You know, it's not this controlled. It's not that it's, and it's not highly intelligent. It's not, it's not. Yeah. I mean, it's very hard to see what his motivation is mm. beyond just yeah just killing people which is a bit boring after a bit i think that's a this is a great note to end on i was going to ask you uh and maybe karen has some final thoughts but what do you think about that wonderful expression the banality of evil ah uh, that is a wonderful expression isn't it and i i think i think it's a deep phrase which needs a lot of attention um because i think there is there are some aspects of evil that are that have a kind of insipid quality. There is, a, or, a, or an absurd quality, the, in the sense of a kind of tone deafness um, to human life, to human sociality. And, and so I think there's something that's worth, that's really worth taking seriously there. And I have certainly met people who's, where the evil that they've committed has been, has been of a kind of a banal, dreary kind a bit like crime and punishment you know mm. where you know it there's no particular reason it's it's a meaningless kind of crime nothing nothing is achieved very much it's just and two lives get wasted for no great purpose and um so you know it's worth a lot of reflection i think mm. raskolnikov absolutely yep. Yeah. Well, I'm reminded of W. H. Auden again as well, who said, uh, "You know, evil was unremarkable and sleeps in our own bed and eats at our own table." <laughs> Ooh. Woo. Yeah. Very evocative. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks you both, and thanks Karen. Uh, this has been thank a, you, thank you, Patrick. just a real treat for us to get a chance to speak with you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I know it's it takes time, and we enjoy the discussion. Thank well, you. Thank you, and so thanks to everyone. It's been a been a love it's been a, a been a lovely evening. So good no good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks everybody for watching too on Facebook. We really appreciate it. And I Thank put you. a link in the comments field. We have copies of the book available for purchase. So uh, thanks again. Bye bye bye. <laughs> Thank right. you. All right. There.